My name is Katie Terrio. I'm a part of our membership team. Thank you for joining us for Ask the Expert. This is a series of conversations that we are doing uh, with our network of experts uh, at Longwood and outside of Longwood, where we're answering members' questions about home gardening. So this is something that we are only offering to members during this time. And if you don't know, this is also our virtual member appreciation week. Um, so you actually have a couple of other fun engaging options available to you. There was an email that went out this Sunday with a lot of those. Uh, that includes uh, cooking alongside our executive chef, Will Brown, um, at 1906. And we have some accompanying recipes that you can download along with those demos. There's also a couple of shopping opportunities. So we have an exclusive partnership and discount that we are doing with White Flower Farm online on their website. And you can, in particular, order custom Longwood tulip bulb mix, which was created with, uh, with White Flower Farm and ourselves. And we also have our 2021 Longwood um, wall calendar available for purchase as well, which makes a great gift. And then finally, we have downloadable botanical illustrations that uh, you can download for the little ones in your life to color um, or for you too. So those are all on our website and they went out in our email on Sunday. Um, so to get started, joining us today to answer your questions on perennials is Jeff Jabko. Uh, Jeff joined us in our first session on vegetable gardening and he is back uh, to talk today about perennials. So Jeff holds um, a master's in horticulture and plant pathology from North Carolina State University. He's also the director of grounds and and coordinator of horticulture for the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College. And he also teaches botany for Longwood's Certificate of Merit in Ornamental Horticulture, um, and is also an instructor in our professional gardener training program. Um, so Jeff, thank you for being back with us today. Thanks, Katie, it's good to be back. <clears throat> So we got a lot of questions um, and we're going to try to uh, cover as much as we can just to give folks a sense of where we're heading. Um, we're going to talk about general picks and varieties for perennials, planting and care, uh, native and pollinator perennials, and then we're also going to touch on propagation and transplanting. Um, this session is likely to run a little bit long so that we can get to as many questions as we can. We also have the Q&A function available to you during this session so you can submit any additional questions that you have. Uh, and at the end, we're gonna leave some time to make sure that we can get to some of those. Um, this is also gonna be recorded and accessible on our website to watch later at your leisure. They're gonna be a part of this whole series on our website and that is available at longwoodgardens.org slash ask the expert. Um, so to get us started, um, Jeff, can you talk just a little bit about perennials? I know when we spoke, you mentioned sort of it's, it's such a broad category um, and just a little bit about how the perennial craze started. All right. Okay. Well, let's start uh, first and let me uh, just discuss a little bit about what, what do we mean by perennials. So perennials, we really are referring to herbaceous perennials. So perennial in that they live for more than one season, so they will come back every year or many years. And uh, they are herbaceous, meaning that the top part of the plant will die back to the ground in the winter time. So the part that remains you know, at ground level or below ground will stay alive through the winter. So that's usually the root system and the crown of the plant. And then in the springtime, then you get new shoots come up and then it go through the whole life cycle of the foliage, the stems, the flowering, setting the seed, and then dying back once we get into um, autumn. And, and colder temperatures. So that's what an herbaceous perennial is, as opposed to something like a woody perennial. So a woody perennial would be a woody tree or shrub where the above ground portion does stay alive in the winter. It might not have any leaves on it, but it is alive. And the other group of plants uh, would be annuals. That's where they would complete their entire life cycle in one season and then die. And the plant has to come back being grown from seed again. So it just lives for one year or a biennial, which is a two-year cycle, and then the plant dies. So these are herbaceous perennials that we're talking about. And I can remember uh, growing up, I started in the horticultural profession when I was young. Uh, I started working uh, at a garden center when I was about 14 years old. And you know there were some perennials that were being grown then. I mean, you know, around everyone's house, kind of good pass-along plants were some daylilies and some peonies, maybe a lily of the valley, and 
you know, a couple of some, some kind of daisy or black eyed Susan or something like that. So there were some perennials around, but then really starting in, um, it would have been in the late 1970s, early 1980s, this period called the perennials craze got started. And there were a couple of landscape architects who started using big sweeps of perennials, where before they were just kind of little things dotted in to kind of like a cottage style border. So there'd be some shrubs and a couple of perennials for color in this. Well, these landscape architects started using perennials in a big way and really massing them in big, big swaths or patches. And some of those initial plants that became very popular at that time was a black-eyed Susan called Rebecca Goldsturm and a sedum called Autumn Joy and uh, an ornamental grass called uh, Penicetum, Penicetum allopicuroides. So those three kind of uh, in big sweeps or mixed together started this perennial craze. And then there became lots more work done, especially in Germany, um, of developing new types of perennials where they were selecting from the perennials that existed already or doing some crossbreeding and selecting so you would get different flower colors, different heights, different hardiness types. And so it really exploded into kind of what we have today, where if you go to a garden center, you know, if they don't have 40 or 50 different genera of perennials, then you're disappointed. Um, and there are new ones coming out all of the time. So that's a little bit about it. And it's certainly, uh, I don't think it's, it's certainly not a fad. It's here to stay. Now, very few people grow Rebecca Goldsturm anymore or Sedum Autumn Joy or the Penicetum, uh, but lots of other things are very, very popular. Uh, so I think we will always have this idea of perennials along with us. And there are many other ways of landscape architects using perennials now not just the big, bold sweeps of things, but lots of other ways that, that we can discuss a little bit as we go on. Yeah, and it sounds, like you said, I think after 40 or so years since that time that you are talking about, um, safe to say it's not a fad. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, great, so our first question from members are, um, so this is from Catherine in Westchester. Catherine wants to know what the best perennials are for our area in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Well, you know, we really live in a great horticultural area, um, and not just because of the great public gardens and private gardens we have in the area, but because of our climate that we have. So, in, in generally speaking, we have very good soils, meaning that they have good fertility. We have adequate rainfall. So, we have somewhere in the range of 42 to 48 inches of rain a year. Uh, so, that's quite a bit. We have cold winters, but they're not excessively cold. Um, we have hot, humid summers, so that can be limiting in some fashion too. Um, but in general, we can grow such a wide, wide, wide range of perennials. And you know, given so, there are some perennials that do better here for us in our area than I think a lot of people when they think of you know where where do people grow perennials? They think of Great Britain. Well, they don't have very hot summers there. And so there are certain perennials that do much better here than in Great Britain because some perennials really need the heat that we have here. We might not like it so much in the summertime. Or if you look in the screen in back of me here, this is a mix of uh, herbaceous perennials plus some annuals. And this is in nature. This is a true alpine meadow. So I was in the Alps of Switzerland and that's what you're seeing behind me. So over hundreds of years, this ecotype has developed uh, having a system like this. And I was there in late June, early July, and the uh, alpine meadow, this is high up, uh, was in full flower. But this is maintained this way from grazing. So, you know, you've always seen the pictures of, you know, the cows grazing in the high alpine meadows. Well, that basically keeps this system going. Uh, for that, that really, you have these really wonderful flowering this time of year. And we have meadows in our area that are well, full of native herbaceous perennials, as well as the prairies of the middle part of the United States. So ones that really do well in our area, 
it, it, there, really, there are literally hundreds of perennials that do well in this area. And I think as we go through today, uh, I'm going to be talking some more specifically about perennials for sun and some for shade and some for different types of soil types. So I'm going to be mentioning a lot of those. So, uh, you know, there are probably very, very few uh, perennials that I would say that you need to steer away from. Uh, you do need to remember that sometimes what we call tender perennials are plants that truly are perennial where they are originally native to. They're not native to here. So if we're growing them, they might be tender, meaning that they might die in the winter time because they can't handle temperatures that excessively cold. So a lot of those we, we grow as annuals because you know the frost is going to kill the tops back, but the cold weather in the winter might kill the root system. Okay. So um, if, uh, if we wanted to start uh, talking about some specific plants for certain areas, do you want to do that now, Katie? Should we do, yeah. talk about some specific ones? Um, so I guess, so their next question was um, certain perennials that are good for shade. Okay. Shade. Okay, so let's start with ones talking about shade. So what is it that's limiting in the shade? So, um, we can think of two different groups uh, of perennials for shade. There are those that um, basically are in our native woodlands around this area. And if you think about how they grow, they come up at the very, very end of winter. They come up above the ground. Uh, they are going to flower and set seed and then even uh, begin to die back as the leaves of the trees are starting to come out. So, this way, these uh, herbaceous perennials, and we call them spring ephemerals, ephemerals because they don't last all season long. They need to get that light energy that's shining on the floor of the forest before all the leaves come out on the trees. So that's why they have such a short season like that. So ones that could be in a group like that, if you think of Virginia bluebells, I have some under some trees in my home garden and they are dying back now. So they have finished their season through the year and they're going to stay dormant the rest, you know, now the, the rest of June all the way until March of next year. And then basically their season is March. They're going to do their flowering in April, usually mid to late April, and then they're going to finish up by early June. So that's one type of uh, spring ephemeral like that. Uh, columbines are in flower now. That's another kind of woodland shade uh, type of flower, the aquilegias. Uh, hepaticas or the liverworts. Um, Senecio or pacara, that's a, that's a really nice native perennial to shade into some sun area. Uh, pulmonaria, lungwort um, is another good one for shade. Pollenmonium or Jacob's ladder, that's a native plant that does well in the shade. Um, a couple of different flocks, the flocks stolonifera and flocks uh, divaricata, both of those are good kind of ground cover uh, plants for shade. A lot of times when people think of shade, they uh, kind of forget uh, a lot of our native ferns. And there are ferns from Asia, ferns from Europe, ferns from North America that all do really, really well in shaded conditions. So one of my favorite is the Christmas fern, which is native, because it is, has, its fronds will stay evergreen. So those fronds at the end of winter just kind of go flat to the ground, and then the new fronds will come up from the middle. So that's really nice to have something evergreen like that. Um, other ferns that are really good for our area, uh, the eastern wood fern, uh, which is Dryopteris marginalis, that will also stay evergreen for us. But also things like lady fern and maidenhair fern and cinnamon fern. So a lot of different ferns. Now those need good moisture. And when you talk about shade, um, it, it, it tends that you either have one of two conditions. Either you have a very, very wet shady area or you have a very dry shady area. So if you're under a lot of big old deciduous trees like sugar maples or something like that, then it tends to be very, very dry. Well, most ferns don't want a condition like that. So there are some uh, perennials that can really handle dry conditions like that. And I think one of the best are epimediums. So there's a whole range of epimediums now. There are wonderful low ground cover. Most of them are going to stay, you know, eight to 12 inches high. Um, they 
typically have foliage that dies back to the ground in the winter time, just kind of turns brown. And then so sometime during the winter, you cut it back to the ground level. And then in very, very early spring, you get these little wiry stems that come up. Uh, and then the leaves are going to start to emerge. They flower very early in the spring. So you can have epimediums in flower in March and April and even into May. I just had some just finishing up. And it's a wonderful uh, ground cover for shade. And once it's established, it's very, very, very drought tolerant. And most of these are colonizing, meaning that they will slowly spread. So they won't just stay a clump, uh, but they will slowly spread and form a bigger, larger area over time. Um, another good group of plants for um, average uh, shade or dry shade. So average, I mean, thinking of average moisture. So you kind of think like a woodland condition, but not really wet, uh, would be hellebores. Uh, and that's another very, very popular group now. Um, because you know, they do have evergreen foliage. Uh, typically in gardening, we do cut that foliage back at the end of winter. And we want to do that before the new shoots start coming up because the foliage will kind of go flat. It will kind of begin to turn brown. So it just really looks good to be tidied up and uh, to have, uh, have fresh, fresh uh, flower stems and flush, fresh leaves coming up from hellebores. Um, and the, uh, the hellebores, uh, they are the... Uh, uh, Lenten rose and uh, Christmas rose, and they go by a couple of different names for the different species. Uh, hostas, a really, really popular group uh, of plants. And, you know, hostas, really, they're grown for their foliage. You know, one of the, one of the few plants uh, that where we're just growing them for foliage and not so much for the flowers. Now, typically, they will flower, and some of them do have very, very nice uh, spike of white or lilac or purple flowers. Um, and some actually happen to be very fragrant, but usually we're growing them for their great variety of foliage. So it can be green or it can be kind of a bluish green or a silvery green, and it can be variegated. So you can kind of have a yellow leafed one or you can have a green and yellow leafed one or a green and white or green and cream, uh, all different types of sizes. Uh, typically they tend to, tend to be somewhat lower. They are clump. There are few species that will spread around, but usually it is a clumping plant. Um, from some that are very, very small and diminutive, just a couple of inches high, to ones that will get three feet high for the foliage. So, but these, those tend to be a very, very tolerant um, shade growing plant. Um, and there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of different cultivars of hostas now. And actually there's hosta, a very active hosta society in our area if you really are interested in those. Um, uh, yeah. just, just to pivot a little bit too, mm -hmm. so in thinking about, so we have some, definitely some good varieties for different, different conditions of shade. Um, is, it, is it a good idea to, or I guess, what would you say about mixing early blooming perennials with late blooming ones? Okay, well, um, I would think it, it all depends on kind of what your design intent is. And I think most of the time, um, very few gardens are just all peak at one season. Like if I think of my home garden, in the front garden, because it used to be under the shade of a big oak tree, it was more of a flower interest in the springtime. So it really was a spring garden. And then once we got into summer, then most of the plants in that area didn't flower in the summer. They would flower in the spring. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to my sunny area in back, where I kind of have something all the time that is in flower. So, and you do that by mixing different types of perennials. So, you know, in one area, you have something that's going to be flowering earlier in the spring, something uh, here in June. And usually we think of perennials, kind of the peak season for most perennials is going to be kind of this June period. But there are ones that are not going to be in flower until, you know, August or September. So for some of the later season summer ones or early fall ones. So you really can have quite a long, long season of perennials from flowering you know, right at the very end of winter. You know, as soon as the snow melts, um, you can have Adonis in flower. So that is going to be late February, early March, and have something that is going to be flowering uh, in late November, early December. So you really can have a long season of flowering with different, different uh, genera of perennials. And so just in thinking also about care, um, 
how long do perennials survive? So do you need to replace, and I know this also depends on your kind of perennial, like you said at the beginning, um, but do you generally, would you need to replace them even though by definition they are perennial or how would you, how would you go about that? Yeah, um, well, many perennials are extremely long lived. I mean, you never have to move them, you know, divide them, replant them, whatever. If you think of peonies or many daylilies or even hostas or some of the, the really the really solid tough things they're going to be around for a long 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 time okay uh, there are some other ones that they tend to kind of outgrow themselves and there are a lot of new eucharists um, the coral bells that um, basically they kind of grow from this crown and the crown kind of gets a bit uh, taller each year, even though it stays relatively short. Well, eventually that crown starts um, breaking apart or degrading a bit. So for an eucara, if you have it in the ground, you know, that, that, that one individual plant of eucara for five or six or seven years, that's getting pretty old and it's probably not going to look as good as it did in years one through five. Uh, so at some point you might want to think about, uh, about removing that. There are some perennials that, um, because of the way that they grow, they get so congested in the middle that they're not getting the moisture and the nutrients they need. And so the outer part of the perennial is looking better than what's in the center. So if you've ever grown bearded iris, you know, they're, they have these rhizomes in the middle part of the plant after five or eight years or whatever, gets so thick with rhizomes that it's not really producing much foliage or flowers anymore. The more productive part is on the edge. So typically those are dug and divided. So that there are some perennials that do better by that dividing, just because they kind of crowd themselves out. But not all are like that. And as I say, there are some perennials that you never really have to touch at all as far as dividing or moving, and they'll just live and live and live. What, um, if you could say maybe like two or three that are like that, that they, they're pretty low maintenance? Oh, low maintenance? Um, yeah, so like I say, uh, daylilies, um, herbaceous peonies, uh, a lot of the ornamental grasses are that way. Um, but even some other things such as uh, monarda, and, uh, bee balm, and salvia. Now, some of those will really, really spread. Uh, Baptisia is a really good long-lived perennial. I mean, it's almost shrub-like in its stature. Uh, that can live for a very, very, very long time. Most of the ferns are going to live for a very long time. And in ferns, you have some that will stay as a clump. The clump will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have some other ones that spread around, like ostrich fern. It'll have an underground rhizome, and it'll pop up three feet away. And that's how it does its things in our, in our native woodlands. It will form these big patches because it spreads so easily like that. And then what kind of care would you say, and again, I know this is a broad question, but care for perennials during the season, so while mm -hmm. they're growing? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, if, if we start, uh, well, let's start during the winter time. So because these are herbaceous perennials, we said about the top dies back. So at some point, you, as a gardener, you would have cut the top back. Sometimes that's done in the fall, sometimes it's done in through the winter, sometimes it's done in very early spring before the new growth starts coming up. Okay, so, so why do we want to do that in gardening? I mean, our native plants, no one's out there in the woods cutting these things back in the winter time. Uh, but in gardening, you're basically, you're, you're tidying up your garden. Yes, if you didn't do the cutting back, those things would naturally degrade and turn into compost and mulch in your garden. But there are some where that old foliage is going to harbor some diseases, so it's better to get it out of there. Like with uh, herbaceous peonies, we always say to cut them back uh, once you know, the foliage dies back in the fall, cut them back completely to the ground and remove that, those stems and those leaves, because those are going to harbor some spores of a fungus for gray mold. And that's one of the things that can affect the blossoms in the spring if we have really wet, warm conditions, is it will, the spores will be released right there from that uh, dead organic matter, come up onto the plant and then affect the plant. So if you get rid of it, it cleans it up. And that's the same way with hellebores, those old leaves, even though they're evergreen through the winter, by cutting them back, if there's any of the fungus that is in those leaves, it's not going to affect the new shoots, the new leaves that are coming up. So doing that kind of tidying up um, 
is going to take place. And if you have something that has good winter interest, then I would recommend you cut it down. It's very late winter. Or once there's heavy snows, have kind of smashed it to the ground and it's not attractive anymore. Uh, so you would do that. The other kind of thing that happens many times with perennials is many will continue flowering for a longer period of time if you deadhead them. So by cutting off the spent flowers so that the energy of the plant is not going into producing seed, you'll get some other growth and more flowers coming up. Uh, an example that a lot of people don't do, but I'm recommending is for our clematis, climbing clematis, which is a perennial plant. Many of them have their tops died back to the ground. Some, the stems will remain uh, alive over winter. But after they're flowering, and a lot of them are flowering right now, you know, some of the early large flowered hybrids and some of the later large flowered hybrids are just starting to flower. Uh, if you deadhead them or cut them back, then you stimulate some new growth so that you can get flowering in August and September again. So for some plants, it'll be like that, or for some, if you're deadheading, they'll just continue flowering. Now, if you deadhead your peonies right as they just finished blooming over the past couple of weeks, they are not going to flower again this year. But the energy is not going into producing the seed pod and the seeds, but the energy is going into the root system to give you more stems and flowering next year. So that's why for many of these things that we do deadheading. Now, some things we just don't deadhead at all because, you know, pictured on your, your screen here right now, you're looking at echinacea. Uh, and echinacea, the, uh, so those petals will drop off, but then that cone in the middle will produce seed. And there are a lot of birds that love that seed. So, um, it, so things like that, typically you don't want to deadhead but to leave them for, for just their visual interest or leave them because wildlife likes them. Yeah. And once you get to know your perennials, then you kind of begin to figure that out. Are they gonna be attractive for you in the fall and in the winter? Or are there um, uh, a birds or something that is attracted to those seed heads that are left there? Yeah. So those are the kind of the two, the two big things, um, I would say, cutting back and the deadheading, other things, you know, some perennials, you know, like to have mulch and, you know, some like some additional fertilizer or compost added to them to keep them vigorous and keep them flowering. Um, so those are some of the other kind of maintenance things that would be done for them. And then this is a question from Catherine in Westchester. Um, my morning glories and moonflowers have holes in their leaves. So this is sort of getting at a pest problem, some of which have killed the plants um, despite using neem on them. Can you talk about common pests of perennials in our area? Okay, well, I mean, once again, it really depends on the, the group or the, the, the family of perennials. There, there are a lot of perennials that are immune from having much of a problem at all. Uh, or if they have a problem, it's not going to really kill the plant. Now, um, the, uh, the morning glories and moonflowers, you know, they're, they're, both, uh, they're both in the same family. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly which insect that this would be that uh, is feeding on it. But if there are holes in the leaves, uh, it's probably from a chewing insect. Um, you said about using neem, you could also use a insecticidal soap. That might help also. Um, the way you describe it about having holes in the leaves, it probably isn't a fungus. But usually just feeding on the leaves by an insect, unless it is feeding on all of the leaves, usually the plant is not going to die. Um, there are some diseases that could cause an entire plant to die, but usually not just some insect feeding on it. Um, one of the most common problems we have on perennials, and because it affects a whole wide range of perennials, is powdery mildew. So you can see powdery mildew, and it looks like um, it looks like talcum powder has been sprinkled on the foliage of the plant. And usually, you start seeing this in the hot days of summer because that's what this fungus likes. And the fungal spores—they're all around us. But when we get those weather conditions that are suitable for it, susceptible plants, you'll start seeing this. And it looks like just a gray film or an off-white film <clears throat> on the surface of the leaves. So they're not a nice green anymore. They're kind of gray looking. And, um, 
it usually it's not going to kill the plant. It might lose some of the foliage that gets really, really uh, affected by that. But we can see powdery mildew on uh, some types of peonies. We can see powdery mildew on phlox. In fact, that's one of the main problems with the garden phlox, the phlox paniculata. Um, and Mount Cuba has done excellent work looking at all the various cultivars of phlox paniculata and which ones are powdery mildew resistant. So look at the, uh, the website for Mount Cuba Center uh, in Greenville, Delaware, and they'll have a really good uh, information publication about phlox that are best for our area, uh, ones that don't get powdery mildew. Uh, and powdery mildew will affect, there's a whole range of other plants. Uh, I've seen it on um, the uh, Rebecca that you have there in your picture. The plant in the background, salvia, I've seen some powdery mildew on certain salvias and veronicas. Um, but yeah, so, so some of the foliage uh, fungal diseases can be an issue with some plants. Some will get some sorts of leaf spots. Usually those are more of a problem when we have warm, humid weather, because that's what those foliage fungal diseases really like, that kind of problem. So just thinking too about um, going in a different direction, natives and pollinators, mm -hmm. um, are either annuals or perennials better pollinators? So you touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, that's a question from Peter in Philadelphia. Okay, well, um, for the pollinators, you know, one of the things, uh, I mean, they've been doing a lot of work for this uh, also at Mount Cuba and um, at the University of Delaware. Um, one of the, for our native pollinators that we have, the best things for pollen sources for them are our native plants, okay? So it really doesn't matter if it's annuals or if it is perennials but flowering for those things that our pollinators really like. Now, if it's a spring ephemeral annual, meaning that it's early in the season, that's good because there's not as many food sources early in the season as there is later on. Um, I would say for, for most of these things, whenever it flowers, whether it's annual or perennial and um, pollinators are attracted to it, it's good. So it really doesn't matter whether it's annual or perennial. Remember, all of these things developed in an ecosystem. And just like that picture you're seeing behind me, that's a mix of annuals and perennials flowering together. Uh, so in an ecosystem like that, the insects that also have evolved along with that ecosystem, they are getting food from both the annuals and the perennials. But one of the things that um, they are finding for our native pollinators that, um, our native plants are tend to be better sources of food for them than non-native, but they will still get some food benefit from non-native plants. Mm. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a complicated thing, but there are some really good articles about that now that you can find. Yeah. yeah. And then are, are perennials, are the, do you know of any perennials that, are, um, that attract hummingbirds? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, actually quite a few. Uh, I was mentioning hosta and the flowering of hosta. So there's uh, one of them, some of them that come out a little bit later in the season, like Aphrodite has big white flowers on it and some of the, the really fragrant ones. Uh, hummingbirds love those, but I think a lot of times when people think of hummingbirds, they think of uh, Lobelia. So Lobelia is a native plant, Lobelia cardinalis, uh, flowers in the mid to late summer, tends to want um, relatively heavy wet soil. So that's what it really, really likes. And uh, if you get that started in an area, if you have soil conditions like that, that will happily seed in um, and even grow into light shade. And it has a wonderful, uh, brilliant red flower that hummingbirds just go crazy over. Um, but for hummingbirds, it, they, they really are attracted to any kind of thing that is kind of tubular in shape. So if you think anything that kind of has a tube opening in it where the nectar would be, then the hummingbird would put its, its bill down into that area to get the, get the nectar. Um, so there are a lot of, um, uh, lot of perennials that are like that. So if you think of an individual flora of a hosta, it's like that. Of lobelia, it's like that. So any of those kind of uh, blossoms like that. Um, and I started seeing... Um, 
hummingbirds up in the Pocono Mountains about three weeks ago. So they're, they're moving north and uh, they were coming in um, and actually uh, a friend had some petunias and the hummingbird was going after the petunias. So, so anything that kind of has that kind of throat or uh, that, that type of funnel form, uh, a hummingbird's going to go after it. Okay. And then thinking about propagation a little bit um, and transplanting. So this is a question we got um, both during registration and then also in our Q&A um, was when, when is the best time to transplant? Hmm. Um, and then I know we had another question specifically about when to transplant for cone flowers. So okay. On that too. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, let's, so let's talk about transplanting, but also kind of dividing because sometimes you're going to be doing the same, same things at, at the same time. So transplanting, so you have a plant and basically you want to dig it up and move it somewhere else. And dividing is because you have a perennial and it has gotten bigger in a clump and you want to divide that up into two pieces or even more pieces and then plant that around. So you get a bigger grouping of them or move it to another site. So that's the difference kind of between transplanting and dividing. Now, usually when we want to do this is not at the time of active growth. So either you would want to do it very early in the spring. So really before significant growth has started. So you're going to dig your plant, divide it up, move it, move it into a different places or, or just completely transplant it. And for many perennials, you can do this in the fall also. So, you know, as the plants are beginning to, to die back, um, that's when you would just cut the tops off, dig them up, move them, or dig them up and divide them. There were a few that really resent being uh, moved in the fall or divided in the fall. There are some uh, warm season grasses. So I'm gonna, you know, ornamental grasses are a big part of our kind of perennials craze now. So there are some warm season grasses that really don't like to be divided in the fall um, because they, uh, they're not gonna be putting out a new root system in the fall. So basically you've chopped through the crown of this plant and you're putting it in its new spot. It's a, um, it's a, a time when the crown might begin to rot and the root system might rot because it's not putting out new roots until the spring. So for something like that, it's better to wait until early spring to divide that. There are some plants though, that really want to be divided or moved in the fall. So peonies, peony of any kind, whether it's a tree peony or herbaceous peony, um, going through September and October is the time to dig them, divide them or dig it and transplant it. Because they have a thick fleshy root system and the only time that they really put out these little tiny white feeder roots is in late fall. So if you're doing that in the spring, the plant is really going to suffer and it's probably better to do that later on. Another group of plants that I don't really like to move in the autumn would be Euchara uh, and sometimes Tiarella. They're both relatively shallow rooted and from my experience, if you do that in the fall and you don't do it early enough in the fall, so say you're doing it in October, November, the plant doesn't get its new root system established quickly enough that in the winter, when we have freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing, it will heave the plant out of the ground, it exposes the crown of the roots, and then the plants die because the roots desiccate or dry, freeze and dry in the winter time. So anything that would be like really too small and it's not going to get rooted in, in time before winter, I would say wait until spring. So if it's a really, really small plant or you're gonna really make small divisions, do that in early spring. Uh, but sometimes it, that can be perfectly fine if you did it in September because they could really get rooted in in time before winter, before we start getting freezing and thawing. Mm. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, I'm gonna transition us a little bit here because we have gotten a lot of questions coming through our Q&A and our <laughs> chat. Um, so we had a lot of other, we actually had a lot of other questions prepared to answer, but I just want to um, take the time to, to look through these and see uh -huh. if we can find um, some to answer. We've, we're gonna try to spend about 10 more minutes here. And we have, I would say probably uh, 10 questions. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll try to okay, do Okay, start it. away. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with, uh, I thought this was a good place to start. Um, 
You talked about shade perennials. Uh, what about some suggestions for sunny? Oh, okay, all right. Uh, and actually, I knew someone was going to ask that, so I have quite a quite a list. Um, I'm going. I'm, I'm very biased about this, so I mean, I'm going to tell you some of the ones that I would recommend if you want to grow perennials. You do some of these. Uh, I think the whole range of geraniums is great. And when I say geraniums, I mean the true perennial geraniums. We also refer to an annual geranium, but that's really, the scientific name is pelargonium. So I'm meaning the hardy geraniums. And rosanne is like one of the most popular perennial plants right now. Has a nice purplish blue flower, um, once full sun, great, great filler plant. It will weave in between other things. Uh, a couple of other spe uh, varieties of geranium like Biocovo, they can handle full sun, dry conditions once they're established, really good, good tough plants. Uh, I'm very passionate for peonies, and so I've mentioned peonies a couple of times. You know, nothing can match the stature of peonies in May. You know, just really, really beautiful plant. Um, lots of people are just crazy about daylilies, and there's such variety, and they're flowering at a time when we're kind of finished with the early summer things, so daylilies are going to be doing their thing in July and August. Uh, so a lot of the early season or the early part of summer perennials have finished flowering or they're fading. Uh, so daylilies are really good for that. Um, salvia. So salvia has been flowering for the past couple of weeks. And if you do some deadheading of those, then they'll come up again. And in a picture you have on the screen, in back of that echinacea, that looks to be Salvia caradonna. Caradonna is my very, very favorite cultivar of all of the salvias. I mean, I really like May night. I really like Blauhugel. Uh, they're all slightly different, but Caradonna, there's thin spires of deep purple and that really, really dark stalk that's up between the individual florets is really nice. How would the C K? What's that? How do you spell it? Or just what's the, how do you, is it? Oh, Caradonna. Yeah. C-A-R-A-D-O-N-N-A, -A -A, Caradonna, all one word, yeah. Um, Baptisia, uh, Baptisia is a native prairie plant and there are some just gorgeous ones that just finished flowering now. Uh, also, Mount Cuba Center has an excellent publication. They did a, a Baptisia trial, so very good. Uh, Amsonia, the, um, uh, the blue star, prairie blue star, Great perennial, excellent fall color, um, big, nice stature to it. You're three feet high, three feet wide. Um, uh, we've used that very successfully here in mass and underplanted it with uh, daffodils. So in the springtime, you get the daffodils flowering. All the Amsonia is, you know, has been cut back to the ground in late winter. So all these daffodils are flowering. Then the Amsonia starts coming up. The daffodil foliage is dying, but the Amsonia foliage grows up and completely covers it. So you don't have to waste your time cutting the foliage of the dying uh, daffodils back. Um, and it is, you know, it flowers usually uh, the Amsonia in May, early June with these steely blue flowers. And then in autumn, the, the foliage and the stems are a wonderful golden color. So it has multiple seasons of interest. And then we keep those stems through the winter until a heavy wet snow will kind of flatten them. Um, Asters, there's a whole range of asters. Um, we actually, in here in the New World, those that are native, we don't call them asters anymore, but I think everyone still knows them as that. The names have changed a little bit. And then all of those things in the composite family, uh, okay. things such as helianthus, heleniums, um, rebeccia, great, great plants for sun. Great, yeah, that is, that is a lot. And that I'm uh -huh. sure will give. And that's only half my list. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I am sure that you could go on. <laughs> um, and especially, too, just because there are there really are so many. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, so this is from Julie Palmer. Um, I have a peony that is over 100 years old. It belongs to my great-grandmother and has been passed down from generation to generation and moved from house to house, now at my house. Um, I have split it into two plants and do nothing to them. One is in full shade and one is in full sun. They seem to be doing fine. Do you have any recommendations on protecting them or caring for them? Okay, so I'm assuming this is an herbaceous peony, one that dies to the ground and not a tree peony or woody peony, um, <clears throat> because those are usually the ones that are passed on. Uh, peonies, uh, herbaceous peonies really like to be in at least half a day of sun, so a half to full day of sun. 
uh, they do not want to be in a wet location. So they want good drainage. Uh, so that's absolutely what they need. Uh, when you plant them, uh, you have these thick fleshy roots and the eyes are the growing points on them. So if you dig them up in the fall, that's what you're going to see. Um, those eyes should be two inches below the surface of the soil. You don't want to plant them more shallow than that and you don't want to plant them deeper than that. So two inches below. Um, they, they do appreciate uh, having lime put down because our soils tend to be acidic here. So uh, put about a half a cup of uh, pulverized limestone around them about every three or four years. They really like a pH of closer to neutral. Uh, and they do appreciate having a slow release, low nitrogen fertilizer applied to them. So we use um, um, an organic fertilizer, which is typically, you know, slow release nitrogen and it's relatively low rates, um, or you can use uh, organic um, flower bulb fertilizer. So when you're planting your tulips and daffodils in the fall, get some extra fertilizer and apply fertilizer to the peonies in the fall, because that's when they're putting out their new roots, about a half a cup per plant, and then also do it as those new shoots emerge in the springtime. So that's what you need to do to be successful with herbaceous peonies. Okay, let's see. Um, this is from Denise. Why would a hydrangea never bloom? I've tried leaving it alone and never pruning, and then also um, pruning it down to the ground. Okay. Well, hydrangeas are actually woody plants, so they're, they're not herbaceous perennials. But um, so why would it never bloom? Uh, it, it most likely is that it is one of the types that is not completely hardy here. So some of the hydrangea macrophylla or some of the hydrangea serrata, uh, basically the, the uh, kind of the lace cap type of hydrangeas, it, they flower on old wood. And if, that, if those stems die back to the ground in the winter time, then, uh, then they're not going to flower for us. Or if you've ever gotten a, a florist hydrangea, those are cultivars that are not hardy for us. They might live, but they're not going to flower because we just get too cold and those stems have died back. So it's probably that. And I would, be, that that's the most common reason that I see. Yeah, and Jeff, to your point too, of it being a woody plant, Denise, just so you know, next week's um, Ask the Expert is going to be on shrubs and woody plants. Uh, so that might be a good one to attend. Um, and anybody who has questions about shrubs or woody plants. Um, so we will have an entire full session on just those those types. Um, let me see. Um, Myrtle has taken over where I had previously planted perennials. Will um, wood will will um, perennials grow through the myrtle? Um, so uh, the myrtle I'm assuming is the vinca minor. Um, some perennials will. So like if you had a hosta it probably would. Um, but it, depending on other perennials, if it was some other kind of spreading ground cover, like a tiarella, which are really, really beautiful, beautiful ground cover in shady areas like that, uh, the, the, uh, the vinca, the myrtle, would probably outcompete the tiarella. Um, so having something like that that is that vigorous of a ground cover, whether it be pachysandra, ivy, vinca, most of those, uh, don't, they don't play well with others. Uh, so they want to take over the patch. Uh, and actually, the least vigorous of all of those is vinca. Um, but depending on what perennials you have, uh, some still aren't going to be able to compete being covered up by that, especially because, you know, these other ones are going dormant in, um, in the wintertime. And as they're trying to emerge in the spring, you have all of these stems of the vinca over top of them and shading them out. Mm. So, so I would say there are a few perennials that can handle that, but the majority of them probably cannot. Any off the top of your head? What's that? And the other ones that could handle that? Um, yeah, uh, so, I mean, if you think of something that is big statured, so like if you had a Joe Pye weed, you know, no problem. That's going to pop up through that. Um, but this is probably, you know, usually Vinca was grown in shade. Um, hellebores would probably be okay, but it would still be growing over the crown of them, so it might mess up the new shoots coming up in, in late winter. Hostas are probably going to be fine for that. Um, something like Mertensia, no, it would crowd that out. Um, pulmonaria would crowd that out. The phloxes it would. 
So there are just a few really in shade that would be able to push up through that. Okay. We're going to do two more questions, mm -hmm. uh, even though we still have many more. Um, and I would say too, do for the ones that we don't get to, um, I would also recommend, and I know Jeff, we had talked about this in our first session too, is uh, the cooperative extensions, that they are a great resource. If you have a really specific issue um, with, a, with a specific plant, um, they are, are available and yep. you can actually check out uh, their websites. A lot of them have forms that you can submit or um, a hotline that you can call. I don't know what's our most local one. Uh, well, actually there's one in Westchester and there's one in uh, Delaware County. So each county should have their own office. They probably have master gardener hotline hours. So if you call uh, Penn State Cooperative Extension for your county, uh, they can tell you that. And especially if you have an insect or disease problem, they're very, very up to date on all of those things. So just with that in mind, um, so we have our second to last question. Um, this is one of the first ones that was submitted. Can perennials be grown successfully in pots? And maybe if you can give like one or two examples. One oh yeah, yeah, I think there, there are many, many, many that could. Uh, in fact, uh, euchara, we have euchras with all these interesting foliage types now, or eucharella or tiarellas, uh, and those are great for pots. And in fact, we mix them with an annuals and tender perennials because of their, just their foliage interest, uh, how that looks all through the season. Hostas, for if you have a shady spot and you want something in a container that is very, very low maintenance, just occasional watering, hostas are beautiful for, for that kind of thing. Um, let's see, other, other things, oh, sedums, so you want something for a hot, dry spot, all kinds of sedums, from really low ones to ones that are going to be getting, you know, 18 inches high to ones that are just ground cover-like, those would be really, really good. Uh, I've seen nepeta salvias, very nice, but they don't continuously flower all through the season. Um, so if you think of something that has really interesting foliage for a container, so that the foliage is the main thing that it's about. Those would be good. And many of the ferns we talked about, beautiful for a shady condition uh, in a container. Yeah, so those are just a couple of, I think, great recommendations for containers. Great, and then um, our last question, uh, which is very much not about summer. <laughs> um, it's very much about winter. What suggestions do you have for good perennials to plant for the winter time? Well, so you can look at that two different ways. So you can look at ones that have interesting architectural look through the winter. So like I said, like right here on the screen, the Rebecca, and you'll have these bare stems with just that, that seed cluster at the top. Really nice. The Amsonia I had mentioned has really nice architectural feature in the winter time. Um, and then there are those that are, are evergreen or semi-evergreen. So I mentioned a couple of ferns that were evergreen like Christmas fern and eastern wood fern, um, uh, hellebores because of their foliage through the winter time can be very, very nice. Uh, Eucharas and tiarellas, most of those, the foliage will look good through much of the winter and then it will kind of brown up. Um, don't count on hostas for winter interest because as soon as you get a frost, all of that foliage just turns to mush and goes right to the ground and you're just gonna have bare, bare spot. But some you know, really do have uh, quite nice, uh, interesting look. Oh, and the ornamental grasses. I mean, the ornamental grasses, you really do want to keep through the winter for as long as you can, uh, just because they, you know, they really, really are beautiful. I mean, if you think of our uh, native meadows that we have, you know, one of the main components of a lot of those are grasses in through there. So whether you're using you know, andropogon or the switchgrass or any of the number of other things, most of those hold up really well through much of the winter time. Great. So I know we are quite over time and we have tried to get to as many questions as we can. Like I said, um, our local cooperative extension is also available. Um, next week, we are gonna be talking about um, shrubs and woody plants. So some questions that have been submitted might actually do well in that session. Um, so I will just keep that in mind for next week. And the registration for next week's Ask the Expert, is it's, actually, it's going to be with um, Eva Monheim. Um, she's gonna be talking about shrubs and woody plants that will be available for registration with our uh, email that's going out this Friday, I believe. It's the Longwood from Home email that everybody's been getting in this meantime. Um, so check that out. And then Jeff, any final words about um, planting or caring for perennials this season? Um, yeah, uh, 
plant butterfly weed and milkweeds. You know, we've, we've been hearing a lot about this the past couple of years about uh, how important these are for our monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, they, they actually are very easy to grow from seed. So if you have any of these now, and there are several different uh, milkweeds, there's the swamp milkweed, and then there's the common milkweed, and then um, there's the butterfly weed. So um, the swamp milkweed can grow in very, very wet, heavy soil or in average garden soil. The, um, the, um, the, the butterfly weed, that's the one that has the bright kind of orangish blossom on it, stays low, much lower than the other ones. It really wants full sun and excellent drainage. So it needs that. But they're all easy to grow from seed. So if you have any, collect the seed in the fall, plant it in pots, and then leave those pots outside in the wintertime. The seed has to go through a winter chilling before, before the seed's going to germinate. Or if you collect the seed, put it in a bit of moist sand in a Ziploc bag in your refrigerator and keep it in there for four or five weeks in the winter time. And then you could get the seed planted up in your peat pots or in your peat pots with the garden, with soil in them, uh, with potting soil and start those on the windowsill in late winter, early spring, and then transplant them out. But they are very easy to grow from seed. Um, and it's a really good plant to have to help our monarch butterflies, as well as the other pollinating insects. I look forward to those every year. I know um, here at Longwood, we get it. We get a good amount. So yeah. uh, it's a nice thing to see. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So just as a reminder, this session has been recorded, so it will be available after the fact. Uh, as I mentioned, we will have um, Eva Monheim next week on Ask the Expert, and she'll be answering questions on shrubs and woody plants, and we have a couple of additional topics coming down the pipeline as well uh, for future weeks. So thank you for all of our members who joined us today. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us, and we hope you learned something new. Uh, we're grateful for all of your engagement and enthusiasm enthusiastic questions, and we look forward to welcoming you back here uh, very shortly. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good day. See you all.